I started uh, treating uh, aneurysm uh, through an endovascular approach uh, maybe in the mid 80s. Uh, so we started off putting non-detachable, non-detachable fibered coils, uh, pushing them. They were not electrically detachable inside aneurysms. And we proved at the time uh, that that was feasible. It was not optimal, but that was feasible, especially in inoperable aneurysm like basilar tip aneurysm and large aneurysm, what have you. Subsequently, with the, I worked with Dr. Jacques Moret, and we used detachable balloons, both ruptured and unruptured, all the way to early 1990s, 1990, 1991, 1992, but specifically in 1992, uh, Guido Guglielmi, who was working at uh, UCLA with uh, Fernando Venuela, came up with the idea of a controlled detachment of a platinum coil. The coil was made out of platinum and it was attached to a stainless steel wire with a small area of uh, soldering. And uh, he had the idea that if we can position one of these coils through a microcatheter inside the aneurysm, and then apply a small electric current, we can electronically uh, detach that coil. And in my opinion, this was a turning point in the treatment of intracranial aneurysms, rather in the endovascular treatment of intracranial aneurysms. The evolution of the uh, aneurysms treatment has suffered a complete revolution in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Well, with 10 years ago, we only had the coiling and balloon remodeling to achieve the better results as possible, but right now, we have so many tools that we can almost treat like close to 100% of the cases endovascularly. It has been a very, uh, very big journey actually in the last 15 years. We first started coiling aneurysms and we only have a couple of microcatheters and coils at that time. And then, then there are some adjunctive devices come and we learn about the reconstructing of the main parent artery who causes, the, who creates the aneurysm. Then the stents come in our field then finally, the, uh, especially in 2008, starting in 2008, that flow diverter stents. Before flow diverters, dedicated flow diverters are available, what we used to do, we were using, using multiple stents in telescopic fashion, we call, you know, we place an in in and try to create our own flow diverters. But after pipeline reached our hands, of course, it was a revolution. All the way to about 10 years ago, when the concept of flow diversion came on board, specifically by uh, Barry Liebert and A.G. Waklu, who really showed on uh, laser particle velocimetry that actually flow diversion can be a very effective treatment uh, of intracranial aneurysm to the uh, introduction of the pipeline device as a flow diversion. The first uh, steps was uh, maybe the, the balloon, uh, the remodeling balloon, then there was the laser cut stands, then we had several innovations, but the most significant one is after that the, the flow diversion with the pipeline and the flow diversion world. We had also the intracellular devices that may be uh, defined as a, a technological disruption as well. In the beginning of the year 2000, we had the ability to use intracranial stent. They were developed on purpose to cross the carotid siphon, so it was self-expandable stent, to help to treat broad-based aneurysms. So this was the aim of the development of the, of the stent at that time. They were laser-cut stent. And many physicians around the world, they mentioned that when they were treating the aneurysm with the stent, they were decreasing the recurrence rate. And this is only due to this uh, clinical observation that two manufacturers have, have developed on purpose the flow diverters. The flow diverter is coming from the experience that we had with tent to make a barrier of, against the flow to avoid the flow entering within the aneurysm. Safety, in my opinion, um, one of the major contribution of uh, flow diversion uh, versus the other endovascular devices is the ease of use and the safety of the device. Because 
We don't touch the wall of the aneurysm. We don't go inside the aneurysm. We treat the aneurysm from the outside by deploying a device in the parent artery. That is a huge difference. We don't go anymore and push coils against the wall of aneurysm, but rather we treat the segment itself which is sick. Aneurysm is a segmental disease of the artery and the, the aneurysm itself is merely a manifestation of the disease. It did change uh, a lot of things in our field. First of all, the most important revolutionary thing, that's what first designed to do so, and was, the, was to be able to start treating the giant aneurysms. We treated more than 100 giant aneurysms, large and giant aneurysms, and then the result was so successful, and the, the device got FDA approval, and to, then they start to be able to using this uh, uh, in the United States. And then we start to use this device to the other aneurysm locations for smaller aneurysms. And especially the most important revolution was the aneurysms start to be able to be treated if they have a vessel coming off the sac. So we have an aneurysm sac and there is a very important vessel coming out of the aneurysm sac. So with intrasuscular treatment, which means that if you put something in the aneurysm, that important vessel was going to be closed and the, the brain area supplied by this important vessel was going to have an infarctus and basically the patient was going to have a neurological deficit. But when we place a flow diverter stent with a pipeline, across this aneurysm without putting anything in that sac. The, the revolutionary change is this, aneurysm gets closes and vessel stays open. Flow diverters have changed our way to work. Uh, indeed, the number of coils used and the number of stands used have decreased dramatically in the last years. And we could say that uh, more or less 50% of our patients are treated by flow diversion. And this is because there is a good uh, treatment, really safe and really effective to completely cure the patient forever. Flow diversion gives us the possibility to treat uh, giant uh, intracavernous aneurysms, very large neck aneurysms, uh, very, very simply. Uh, we used to uh, cause and recoils uh, aneurysms with a higher level of frequency rate, but for all the uh, carotid area, the flow diverter has become a first choice treatment. So with the flow diversion, you do one treatment that is short and it is safe because you don't have to go into the aneurysm sac and the level of recurrence is almost uh, nothing. So you, you have a complete and lifelong treatment with one intervention that can, can last like uh, 30 or 40 minutes. At the end of the year 2000, beginning of the year 2010, the flow diverters and especially the pipeline, they were mostly used in large aneurysm, which were bad candidates for coiling. And progressively we shifted to another paradigm, to, which was to treat even smaller aneurysm because it was tremendously efficient. So we were not touching the sac of the aneurysm, we were not manipulating the sac, and we were just treating the, the vessel wall, and just by delivering a, a, a pipeline, the patient was cured. Now there is a there is new evolution of the flow diversion that allows us now to think to uh, more distal aneurysms like the cerebral anterior aneurysms, like the pericalosal aneurysms. They are also a uh, good indication for flow diversion with uh, some uh, lower profile uh, devices. And uh, we have also the possibility now to address some, uh, in, in certain cases, bifurcation aneurysms. To me, there was a revolution for the treatment of aneurysm. Me personally, I really, first I couldn't believe it, that this really can work. And then subsequently, as I started doing patients, it was very evident that the concept worked, and this is the future of treatment of aneurysm. And we, we are, I think time has proven us right that flow diversion is safe and effective. It's not perfect, but it's excellent way of treating aneurysm. The pipeline itself, because it was the first device on the market and for a long time, so it has become synonymous, the pipeline is really synonymous with flow diversion. But subsequently and today, there are many other devices that have come on the market that mimic uh, pipeline. 
but it and by itself, because it was the first on the market, and because of the continuous improvement on the pipeline, either the shield the, 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 the shield technology or the pipe bar flex or improvement in the detachment mechanism of the pipeline, uh, it has made a, 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 a significant impact. The first uh, pipeline I had the chance to use, it was probably a, around the 2008. It was a startup company, it was named Chestnut at that time. And uh, it was very surprising because it was looking like a sock. And uh, it was very surprising to use it because it was pretty easy to use. So this was the second revolution. The first one was the coils. The pipeline was the second revolution in the treatment of, the, of, these, uh, of those kind of aneurysms. In fact, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. This is evolution of medicine. But the way you treat aneurysm in 2019 versus how it was, they were treated 20 years back, it's much easier. You better see, you have a tremendous evolution in the image quality. You have 3D with a, a very accurate uh, anatomy. And you have the access which allow to, to access to the, to the supraortic vessel, which are very stable. And this is a tremendous evolution. At the very beginning, when we were deploying uh, the, the pipeline, we were missing some catheter with a good support at the level of the neck. Nowadays, we have all the materials that is um, uh, available for this kind of support. And honestly, to deploy a flow diverter or to deploy a pipeline nowadays, in most of the cases, it's quite easy. So you can get a complete cure of a patient in a more easy fashion that it was possible 15 years ago. Pipeline was the first flow diverter available here as the first one that we, we treat after, after that with the new development, the new delivery system and now with the new uh, shield technology allow us to increase the number of indications and uh, we are now very uh, comfortable with the device because it's a clinically proven uh, device. We know that it's safe and we know for many many years for more than five years with a series of 10 years that is really safe and effective for the treatment of intracranial aneurysms. The big advantage of the pipeline was the, the strong fo the radial force. The, the, the opening of the device was really nice in the distal part and the proximal part. It has improved because on the, on the first generation of the device, the, the distal opening was a challenge each time. It was challenging to make uh, uh, to open uh, the distality of the device, but it has changed over time. But I think the big strength of the device was he, he was uh, with a very nice radial forces. So uh, the quality of opening of the device compared to the, the, the competitor was uh, very straightforward and it was uh, helping the community to, to trust in the device. In my opinion, a lot of time, we're not sure how many device we have to put uh, for the treatment of a single aneurysm. Empirically, if the aneurysm is large or fusiform, we have to put more devices than if the aneurysm is small or sidewall. So if there was a device that can be tailored from one patient to another or from one, uh, one aneurysm to another, uh, in other words, one device that can do all the effect of multiple devices. Uh, that's on the, on, the, on the device itself. Make the device either treat the metal itself or treat the, or polish the metal or to, uh, to avoid adherence of platelets on it and therefore maybe move away from the use of dual antiplatelet therapy. Make the device uh, more flexible and go through small micro catheter like a 10 micro catheter. So miniaturizing is also an issue. Uh, make it uh, flexible, easy to use, safe to deploy, retrievable. Uh, and we're getting there. There are many, many improvements on the pipeline and other devices that are being uh, done today, which has improved the technology. Uh, impact of treatment, again, uh, just make it affordable. Uh, make it such that uh, people can benefit from this technology uh, either uh, through healthcare system that cover the cost or if they have to pay through insurance or what have you that uh, the device is affordable it is it is again very important
to keep the financial impact on society and third party payers to make sure this wonderful technology is available and can treat patients at a reasonable price. That is very important. That message should go out to everybody that help us provide this treatment to people who need it. The training wise, Medtronic has a lot to do, a lot to do, especially in, in many countries that those modern anti-aggregant agents cannot be used or cannot be reached. So with the old clopidor grill, we may have a lot of troubles. So basically, so the, the training of these physicians and making those anti contemporary anti-aggregants available for these patients in that particular countries are becoming very, very important for the patient's safety. The future of devices will be uh, have less thermogenic devices and lower profiles. If we can combine this, a lower profile with a less thermogenic device will be uh, awesome to have it to treat the aneurysm. Clinically, we need to collect all the data. It could be included in, in uh, all the data as possible into, into a trial, different trial, like a SPAR trial to get all the data available. Of course, training is basic. We need to, to establish any kind of contact with the people, proctoring, remote proctoring, virtual reality, but we need to continue to try to invest the time in, uh, in training the young people, young generation with 3D printed models or so any other option, but uh, try to focus uh, our uh, attention in training people because in the next year, maybe we are, don't have enough people to treat all the patients available in, in, in the world. So we need to focus on, on the training. You need to be trained with this device, uh, not only on the technical part, you need to be trained on the indication, trained on the deployment, trained on the sizing, trained on the deployment, and trained also on the pharmacologic environment. I think it's, a, it's not just a technical aspect. So this is a, a global task for the industry, but I think the, uh, the education around the flow diversion and around the use of the pipeline is a massive, massive mission if they want uh, this procedure being uh, largely um, available uh, worldwide. It is sad to just think that in 2019, when you discover a non-ruptured aneurysm, the decision making to treat or not to treat is the same as we had 20 years ago. We didn't have any evolution in our thinking how to manage a non-ruptured aneurysm. And this is a big failure. We did a lot of improvement thanks to the technology, thanks to the understanding how to treat, but we completely failed how to manage a non-ruptured aneurysm. And in my opinion, this is a challenge for the coming years, how to better understand what is the evolution of the aneurysm. Probably we are treating non-ruptured aneurysm, which normally not necessitate to be treated. In terms of impact of healthcare systems, of course, there's a big impact because the, the aneurysms we've been treating with the pipeline, they are we're just able to discharge them next day. I mean, they were able to be treated with surgery. The, the patients were staying in the hospital days. They used to stay in the hospital in ICU. They were maybe losing their job and they couldn't go back to their original lifestyle. And so there is a huge impact, of course, with all endovascular treatment, but also with the, with the impact of pipeline in the endovascular treatment of animals. I think um, to, to improve the, the treatment of aneurysm should also involve improvement in the detection of, of aneurysm in the genetic predisposition, predisposition to developing aneurysm. And also if there are ways, non-interventional ways of treating aneurysms or at least diminishing the risk of rupture of an existing aneurysm. There are still uh, lackings. So what the, what the lackings are just uh, basically to be able to uh, treat especially ruptured aneurysms with flow diverter stents, with pipeline. Now we still have to give some blood thinners. But of course, this is pretty controversial. You know, you have a patient with bleeding in his brain or her brain, but you have, have to give a blood thinner. So basically the technology right now is trying to solve that situation. And actually the Met Metronic did that. We have now new pipeline shield. The, the, the shield technology pipeline was 
and may be started to be used with much, much less effective blood thinners, maybe with only aspirin. So that's going to be the next revolution. Of course, the, the what we want, we should be able to treat aneurysm with pipeline without any blood thinner, like uh, anti aggregant agents, like uh, aspirin or Plavix kind of drugs. So I think the company needs to work on that. In the future, what is sure is that uh, almost all the aneurysm will be treated endovascularly. So we need to focus and we need to be open-minded to include new technology coming into the market, stands for the vertex, intersacular devices, better coils. But probably the best combination between materials will be the, the future. But we need to focus also on the biology. We need to understand the biocompatibility. We need to understand the intravascular imaging. So we need to combine all the tools available in the future in order to get better, better uh, results. I think we go today with a combination of intrasacular device and flow diversion. I see now the, ten, the, the trend we have now in Montpellier is really that we are reducing the number of coils, increasing the number of intrasacular device, increasing the number of flow diverters. So uh, why? Because it uh, allows you to make short treatment, safe treatment, and, uh, you, and after you have to adapt the pharmacologic environment. You also have to uh, be focused on the sizing of the implant. But if you fulfill these points, you are reducing the time you are spending in the patient. So it's more safety, I, I guess, more efficacy also in the future for the patients.